All right, I have a question. I have a question tonight. I want to talk about I want to talk about peace. And so, um, does your life get more peaceful around Christmas or less peaceful? Less, less peaceful. Uh, some of you said more, and I think it's I think it's a little bit of of both, depending on which part. So the the less peaceful. The less peaceful is like cramming for midterms. How many of you had midterms? Okay. Uh, how many of you? How many of you did not do well? Okay. Ugh. Sorry to hear that. Um, uh, okay. So midterms, they make that. How many of you? How many of you stressed a little bit over like finding a perfect present? Rather, you're trying to find something that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I ha- I have felt that. I've felt that panic. Uh, the worst people in the world are the people who you want to buy a gift for who go. I don't know. I don't really want anything. They're the worst. They're the absolute worst. Are did any of you say those words this year? You're terrible people. Okay, your loved ones hate you. Um, okay, maybe another part of like the stress of all of this is like um, juggling families, and so you've got you've got like a holiday and part of the morning, and then you got to do something else in the afternoon, and then you got to go to another city and do this, and then um, and you know there's some d- just kind of different dynamics, and so maybe all of that adds to some stress. Um, hopefully, hopefully peace is somewhat associated for Christmas with you. I mean, um, it, it's a little bit of a time off. You don't have some of the normal uh, normal responsibilities in your life. Like you don't have, um, school giving the same pressure. You might have a, a, a little bit off of work or, um, or maybe you work in like, uh, food service and then you have more work. Um, sorry. Uh, but, but hopefully, uh, hopefully that, that peace is somewhat associated with Christmas. Um, but often it, it really isn't. And, and then we, we come back. And so in, in a couple weeks, you're going to get right back into everything that was kind of routine and maybe some of the niceness. Like everybody is really nice around Christmas, right? Um, except people in lines. Everybody else is really nice. Um, uh, they're like nicer. They're cheerier. They sing songs in public. Um, it's just like weird things like that. And then that all disappears when Christmas is over. And, um, and yet th- there is something genuinely real about um, the arrival of Jesus and the promise of peace. And last week, Daniel talked about um, that, that Jesus is, is four things, and his arrival is, is this kind of this promise that he's the, the, the everlasting father, the mighty God, um, uh, the prince of peace, and the wonderful counselor. But the prince of peace, like Jesus shows up as the Prince of Peace. And if you heard me talk uh, on a, a Sunday a couple weeks ago, you heard me talk about how, how really weird I, the idea of Prince of Peace is in baby form. Um, and, and, and literally, the, uh, like a couple days later, I saw an Instagram picture, and it was a picture of, of a baby screaming, and the, and the title was Prince of Peace, right? Like, and it was literally like a callback to like, you see the irony, right? But there is really something that the Prince of Peace promises peace. And when I say peace, I'll tell you, um, maybe you're different from me. But when I hear peace and when I say peace, more often than not, I go to a abstract concept of peace as a feeling. So peace means like, oh, I just feel relaxed today. Like I didn't have anybody breathing down my neck. That's peace. Um, peace is peace in, in in those terms is just when I feel good because things aren't going bad around me, right? Um, but but how many of you know like that's not th- that 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 kind of peace is really meaningless because at any moment something could come and steal that, right? And I I um you know I I knew I was going to preach this and so I I have this in my mind. And Friday night I was having a normal Friday night um just think like we were making dinner we were um doing stuff with the kids and one of my kids jumped up on a pull-up bar uh one of those that like hang in the door right hangs in the door and so he jumped up on it yeah you know where this is going uh and so he pulled it right off and it came back and and split his head okay now here's the deal here's the deal before you panic uh i do need to clarify it's not bad he has one staple, and he has milked that for all it's worth, okay? So don't feel bad for him, but if you do get to ask uh, my kid, you'd be like, hey, you heard you split your head open. He'd be like, yeah, it's huge. So anyway, he loves it. But we freaked out because in that 
moment, like, blood is literally shooting. I, something about, like, the back of the head. Um, and so, like, blood is, like, going places, okay? And so, um, so, so here's the deal. In that moment, peace did not arrive. Peace was not delivered. Nobody brought peace. And if I was waiting on situations to bring me peace, we would be bankrupt, right? I, I mean, I, if, if we're just waiting for peace to be given to you and that's the only way that you can experience peace, don't you recognize that, like, we'll never get it? And, 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 and I know you get it. Like, you... Like, this generation is the most stressed generation. It's the most anxious generation. It's the generation on more anti-anxiety medications than any other generation. And the generation that, despite anti-anxiety medications, still suffers more, right? I mean, it's just this, like, it's this weird snowball of, like, stress, anxiety, and it just feeds itself, and it creates more and more and more and more problems. And wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be just powerful if we actually had a real peace. Like if, if peace was more than just idea and more than just concept and it was concrete inside of the arrival of Jesus. And, and tonight I, I want to pull out kind of a, um, an obscure passage. I mean, it's not obscure. It's in, it's in the Bible. It, it, it's Luke chapter 1. If you've got a Bible, go to Luke chapter 1. Um, just pull out your, your phone, go Luke chapter 1 with me. I just want to read you a, a few verses. It's obscure because it's in the middle of a story that probably needs some backstory. So do me a favor, sometime this week, go and read Luke chapter 1, and then um, uh, as you continue to roll into Christmas, read Luke chapter 2 and read the story of, uh, of Jesus' arrival. But, but Luke chapter 1, let me skip some big important details about the story. There's a guy named Zechariah. And his wife is Elizabeth, and the Bible describes them as very old. And you probably immediately understand that nobody describes anyone very old and means that as a compliment, right? Like nobody, nobody's like, oh, man, he is so old, which makes him dope, right? Like, um, no, 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 very old. And so they're so old that they can't have kids, and they're old in life. And, and, um, and, and Zechariah uh, ha- has an angel come, and the angel... Uh, the angel says, your, your wife is going to have a son. And Zechariah goes, well, how can I know for sure? And the angel goes, well, how about this? You won't be able to speak anymore. And so Zechariah walks away from his angel meeting, unable to speak again, okay, um, until the baby is born and he fulfills one of the things that the angel had asked. He said, I need you to name the baby John. And, and Zechariah, he writes down, the baby's name is John. And the Bible says at that moment, his mouth opened. And I don't know, can you imagine, um, how, how many of you love to talk? Uh, okay, you love to talk. How many of you, how many of you love, um, maybe you don't love to talk, maybe you're the introvert, but you know that every once in a while, you have to just, uh, you just have to unload on somebody, right? You just have to pour out somewhere. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Imagine not being able to talk for nine months, right? Just imagine like the little low level of insanity that you feel at that point, right? And, and Zachariah, he gets his voice back and he begins to sing. And it's not just any song, it's a prophetic song. It means it's about the future. And so in Luke chapter 1, he begins to speak. And he says this, verse 76. Uh, so I realize you got to scroll a little bit. You just went to Luke 1, you're like, wait, Luke 1 verse 1? You're like, no, 76, dang it. All right, Luke 1, 76. He says, And you, my little son, talking about his son John, will be called the prophet of the Most High because you'll prepare the way for the Lord. Verse 77, you'll tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins. Because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness in the, in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. Now, I love this. There's this really beautiful, beautiful scene. I don't know if you, if you, if you see it, but here's what Zachariah sees spiritually, that when Jesus arrives, it's like light shines from heaven for the very first time. And up until that point, 
every one of us had, be, had been living in darkness. Close your eyes for me. Close your eyes. Okay, I know that's not pitch black because I have two giant construction lights. So you, your eyes are still probably closed and you can probably see some just illumination even through your skin, right? But, but imagine pitch, utter darkness. And every single human is, is brought into pitch, utter darkness. This is the world without Jesus. And, and in that darkness, you have to find a way to a place that you've never been to. I mean, if I imagine, if you were blind right now and I said, hey, go find your way home, some of you, maybe 10% of you would make it home, right? But if I told you to find somewhere specific and you've never been there before, but you can't see anything, you're completely out of luck. And not only is that our situation, but it says that, that the enemy, death, is hiding in the darkness after you. All right, open your eyes, open your eyes. I, just think about, think about this, think about this, right? Like, um, how many of you have ever heard a noise in the night that you could not identify? Okay, that's, there are few things scarier than that. One year, I, I remember when I was, I, I, was still in, I was still in high school, I heard somebody m pulling the grill outside of, like, on our patio. Like somebody pulling the grill. So they pulled it and then they stopped. It's like midnight. And so I, like I begin to freak out, right? Like my room, my room has, is literally like the, the grill is on the other side of my wall. So like I hear it and they move it a little bit and stop. Move it a little bit and stop. And I'm, I, I am freaking, freaking out. And so I do what every, I feel like what every, high school male would do, I grabbed a weapon and began to army crawl toward the door. I was like, somebody's going down tonight. <laughs> right? like, and, and then I got, to, I got to the window and just started to like peek out a little bit. And that's the moment that I realized it was the sprinkler sounding like the grill being moved. And, uh, and so like uh, totally not what I thought it was, but there's this moment of fear, right? When you hear something in the darkness and you're like, oh my gosh, what is that? This is, this is life. This is life. This is why we are anxious. This is why we are stressed because we can't see what's around us and we're trying to live life in utter darkness having no idea what way we need to go. And this is why the arrival of Jesus isn't just like, it's peace. No, no, no. It's the literal arrival of a, pro like it's peace. And it has a backing. Because Jesus historically really came and he proved that peace is real. Have you ever played make-believe with a little kid? Like, it's all awesome. It's super awesome. You're playing make-believe and you're like, hey, I'm at your candy store today and I have a million dollars to spend on candy. And you're like, awesome. Until they go, where's the million dollars? Right? Like, make-believe is all, it's all fun and it's all fun, but there's no backing to it. Right? And this is, this is, this is how Jesus describes the peace that the world brings. In fact, he, he says in, in, in John, I think it's John 14, verse 27, where he says, he says, the world promises you a peace, but it's meaningless. Uh, like it just has, it, it has nothing behind it. It's like they're playing make-believe. They're like, yeah, this is peace, but it's not real peace. But the arrival of Jesus, oh, it's so amazing because it, it reveals peace, I think, in three different ways. The reason I picked this really weird prophecy is because I think it highlights three things for us. One, for the first time ever, the arrival of Jesus means that you can actually see who you really are. Let me explain something. Your identity is hidden in shadow until you meet Jesus. And, and let me be completely honest uh, and transparent, just so you understand that I don't mean that, that, hey, once you say, Jesus, I believe in you, that you fully understand who you are. That is not true at all. But I will say that you cannot fully understand who you are until Jesus shows up and shines a light onto your life. Here's why. Because he made you and he designed you. He made you who you are. You cannot see who that really is until he shines a light into your life. And guess what? When you recognize who you really are and know who you are, there's a peace that is real that comes in. Because then you don't have to try to be anybody else. What is the, what is the one thing that confuses our identities more than anything else? It's the game of comparison. 
Because you look at somebody else and you say, maybe I could be that. Or maybe I do not want to be that at all. And then you try to build your identity around this. Can I tell you, genuinely, m- not more than anything, that would, that would be a lie. Um, but genuinely, I have always wanted to have a really epic slam dunk moment in basketball. Like, I, I just genuinely, like, I genuinely want to be able to, like, jump the extra five feet to be able to, like, smash something into, like, a back, like, like, I want that. But can I tell you, that will never happen outside of, like, Sky Zone basketball, right? Like, that will never, ever happen. There is things that, that you will put on your life, you will put burdens on your identity until Jesus reveals who you really are and you can see it. And let me tell you something. There's a peace that comes when you can know yourself with Jesus. You don't have to be fake. You don't have to be anything that you are not. Like, it's a real peace. That's who you really are. The other piece of this is when the light of of Jesus shines on us, it says it illuminates the path. And it leads us, and, and it, it's the path of righteousness. It, it, Jesus came and he showed you the right way to live. Can I tell you something? There's a calm and a peace when you are doing what you know to do. There's a calm and peace that, I mean, all right, and, and not even in righteousness. How many of you know that the first day on a job is kind of terrifying? Like you have no idea what you're doing. And there's going to be a moment on that first day of work where the person who's training you goes, oh, sorry, I need to do something. And they leave you with a responsibility that you cannot handle. Like one time somebody left me with a baby in high school and I was like, I'm going to break. I'm going to, I will break this kid. (laughs) I have no skill here. I have nothing. I don't know what to contribute to this life. Like, there's those moments when you don't know what to do. We, we, there's stress that comes, but Jesus shines on the right way to live. How many of you know that it's really stressful when you're trying to hide from something wrong that you did? That's, that, is, that is horrible, right? When your parents have almost caught you in a lie, and they're like, I'm not sure that that story lines up, and your heart just... <sighs> right? Like... like <laughs> My, my, kids, my kids lie about the stupidest things right now. They're like things that I can test. Like, did you wash your hands? Yes. All right, come here. Let me touch your hands. These are dry hands. Go wash them. Right? <laughs> it's that easy. It's, that, it's just that easy. And here's the thing. I know in that moment they freak out. The moment that I'm like, come here. Pa- all panic. <laughs> right? Just like that moment. And and here's why, because there is a stress that comes when we are not doing what is right. In the light of Jesus, for the first time in our lives, it illuminates this way, and you can actually see what the right thing to do is, and there's a peace that comes when we do what the right thing to do is. Can I just try to apply this in a really simple, simple way? Um, uh, some Some of you are not good at math. Who's not good at math? Okay, yeah, you, you know it. You know it about yourself. You know it about yourself. How, how many of you, though, how, okay, you, you don't have to raise your hand anymore, but, like, when you are not good at something, that, that there is a pressure on you to be good at it. Like, you're not good at math. You're not good at language. You are not good at, at Spanish. You are not good at gym. You are, like, whatever the thing is that you are not good at. But, yeah, you, you, you feel maybe an expectation from your parents or your teacher, like, hey, I need you to perform better. I need you to do better here. I need, and it, like, I want to see A's. I want to see B's. I want to see C's. Maybe your parents are just, like, just, just pass, right? Like, whatever that is. But maybe there's this pressure that comes from above. But here's the thing. Not everyone, and you know this, but not everyone is made math genius. You got that, right? Like there's a kid in your class who has never studied for math, who has never tried, who, is, who has never had to ask, like they, they don't even ask the teacher questions. Like, and they just get, they're getting A's back. And you can just sit back and go, I hate you. I hate you. 
But can you recognize something that there is a way that you are designed? And if you try to pretend like you are math savant, you will you will destroy yourself trying to be something that you are not. Okay. The next part of that is the next part of that is do everything that you know to do. If your teacher gives you homework, do your homework. That's something that you know to do. If your teacher asks you to study or your parents ask you to study, you should study. They're your authorities. They've asked you to do this, do that. But once you've done everything that you know to do, right, you've done what's right, and you turn in that assignment, and it comes back as an F, like recognize that you do not have to feel guilt for that. Okay. Like that? Okay. Are you following? Following a little bit? But that can apply to a million things. Okay, but here's the deal. Here's the deal. Jesus, he, for the first time in your life, you can see who you really are. For the first time, we can see the right way, and he shows us the right way to live. But um, how many of us know there's a difference between knowing something and doing something? There, there's a million things that, you, that you've heard somebody say to you and say, hey, I need you to do this. And you were like, yes, but no, I will not do that. And, and, and it, when, it comes to, when it comes to spiritual things, even more so, like I probably, I probably never, ever, ever needed to stand up and preach a message that said lying is bad. And yet, if I asked us to raise our hands, I'm pretty confident many of us would say, I lied this week. Right? What? So, so there's a difference between knowing and doing. And the reality is Jesus has come. Most of you, many of you have Jesus in your life and you see the light shining and you know the way to go and you know what you're supposed to do. And yet there are moments that you do not do what you are supposed to do. And do you know what? In those moments, we are guilty of something. Guilt brings stress, doesn't it? Like guilt robs us of peace. But you know what's in, in, in so incredible to me? That the miss, mission of Jesus isn't just shining a light, showing us the way. But it's also paying for our mistakes. Like, like Jesus doesn't just say, here's who you are. Here's the way to walk. And I hope you can make it. He says, here's who you are. Here's the way to walk. And I know that you messed up, but you know that if you ask me for forgiveness, the guilt is gone. Guess what? The world, when they are guilty of something, they have nothing that genuinely forgives them. And they have to carry that guilt. Listen, I know so many people that are not Christians. They don't believe in God. They don't even believe that these things are sin. And so they live and, and they, they, may not even, they, they may not even feel guilt because they, they don't even think that they've done wrong. But that doesn't matter. They have guilt. You know what I mean? Like, like I, I, I have a friend who, who, who tore something in their body and they went years before noticing it. Like, it doesn't matter that they didn't notice it. They had something ripped in their body. The guilt is there. It's real, even if they didn't feel it for the longest time, but it's there. But guess what? Jesus is the only one who can look you in the eye and say, that guilt I've taken. And in exchange, I want to give you a really real peace. Like, so when we say that Jesus is the Prince of Peace and he comes and he brings peace, it's not, what I'm not saying is that everything goes smooth. And what I'm not saying is that you will have emotions of peace more randomly. What I'm saying is that peace is a real thing that as believers you can discover and know in a way that no one else on earth can. Your guilt can be wiped by Jesus. The right way to live is illuminated by Jesus. And who you are can be known through Jesus. So I, I just wanted to end this year Bringing this idea before you that like more than just idea, more than just moment, more than just abstraction. Jesus is a prince of peace who brings 
a real peace. Do me a favor one more time. Close your eyes. I lied. Open your eyes back up. One more idea. The world has all kinds of ideas and remedies for, for bringing peace. Uh, and, 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 and many of them are, are going to show up on December 25th. Like you, you, have, you have games that will distract you so that you can, can get away to feel a moment of peace. And you'll have clothes that will make you feel better about yourself so that you um, can, can, can feel a peace. And you'll, you'll get a, a new device that finally simplifies your life and makes it easier. And so you can have more peace. But every single one of those gifts that we give and every single solution from the world that, that brings peace from substance to idol to item to person, it, it, it can never get at the root of our anxiety and stress. Jesus, Jesus um, he, he illuminates. Zechariah, when he's prophesying, he says, Here's this, here is the core root of every piece of stress you've ever had in your life. It comes from the darkness, the threat of death, the way that you can't see, the fact that you don't know yourself, and the guilt that you carry. That's every piece of stress you've ever had. And the world does, does this. It, it, all it can do is it can't get to the root, but it can, it can take off, like it can rip off the, the top leaf. It, it can pull up the, 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 the top part, and it makes it feel better for a moment. But if you know anything, the, like with weeds, like just ripping that top part, it's going to grow right back. The only way to get rid of this is to get it by the root, and the only one who can get to the root in this life is somebody who can spiritually shine a light into a darkness, and that was only Jesus. Like, like he's the... He's the only one that can shine that. Everybody can try, to, can, try to, um, can try to feel around in the darkness and point to, I think it's this way and I think it's this way. And Jesus is the only one who says, this is the road. Let's go. So now close your eyes. As we end this year, I, I, I just want to pray for, for peace. I want to pray over all three of those things. So it's just, it's just, it's just us and the Lord right now. If any of you would say that, like, it, you need, you, you need the peace from Jesus that comes in knowing who you are, would you just raise your hand? Ah, oh, so cool. Come on, I know that Jesus can do that for you. It won't be immediate, but He's going to shine a light in that. And you're going to see it. Come on, put your hands down. If you, if you tonight, you need a peace that comes from just seeing what the right thing to do is. Would you just raise your hand for me? Yeah, that's so good. All right, put your hands down. And if tonight you would say, I need the peace that comes from the forgiveness, the wiping away of this guilt, would you raise your hands? Hmm. Hmm. Come on, let's pray together. If you raised your hand for any of that, would you put both hands out in front of you? Lord God, you are our Father. And, and, and the one greatest description of a father in the Bible is is when Jesus says our, our Father loves us enough to give us good gifts. And those good gifts end up actually meaning the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit says that he produces peace in our lives. So God, it's not just a myth. It's not just an idea. It's not even just a hope, like we hope for peace. You actually promise that peace would be a fruit that can grow and be born in our lives. So Lord God, I pray for every single one of these students who would say that 
that um, they need the peace that comes from when Jesus shows them who they are. Lord God, I pray for revelation in their life. I pray for insight from leaders around them, for people to say, I see who you are. God, I pray that the word reveals who they are, that when scripture is, uh, is read by them and spoken over them, that they would recognize their role in the story of the Bible, God, and that that would be, um, that they would see and know who they are, and not even just generally, Lord, that specifically that you would reveal this and bring a peace that there would be an end to comparison lord god i pray father i pray over those who need to see the right way forward god and 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 and, and the bible itself says that you would be a light to our feet and a lamp to our path and i love the image of that because a light for a path is 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 only a few steps ahead. When I have my flashlight out, I can only see a few steps ahead of me. Lord, I pray that day by day by day that you would illuminate what the right way forward is and that they would follow it and feel that peace that comes from doing what's right. And Lord God, there is not a single one of us that is without sin. God, leaders included, God, myself included, I am not without sin. And Lord God, in my own life, I recognize that there are things that I have carried guilt for that I know that you've forgiven. So Lord God, we just tonight, we, we say before you, Jesus, be our Lord and our Savior Wash us clean. Take the guilt that was destroyed on the cross. God, and bring us the peace that comes instead. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Vox, that, that passage that Zechariah prophesized that end part i i have i never realized it um I, I never realized it until recently but uh that passage is adapted into one of the big christmas songs that you've probably sung before um o come o come emmanuel and in it the very third verse he says come thou day spring which is the the source of light come and cheer Thine, our spirits with your advent, with your arrival here, um, disperse the gloomy clouds of night and disperse dark shadows and put them to flight. This is what he, this is, this is what, you've sang it a million times, but it's the prophecy of Zechariah and the promise of what Jesus does. And so um, my, one of my favorite things to do, Rebecca, would you bring that? Thank you. Um, one of my favorite things to do with my own family is to, um, is to, to, to worship with them. And I don't do it. I don't do it well, but it, it, it would be it, it would be my treat to to worship with you guys. So our leaders are going to pass out the lyrics because it's an old song that I know none of you know. Um, but I've also asked Miss Leah to join me up here to sing with me. So would you all make some noise for Miss Leah? And uh, as you get as you get a sheet, would you stand up? Would you stand up? Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel.
Love you guys so much.